Praise the Lord, everybody. My God. How many know that if it had not been for the Lord on your side, where would we be? Mm. I, it's so humbling to think about where we might be if it had not been for God. I invite you to pray with me this morning. God, we thank you for yet another Sunday. And we come, God, grateful because today was not promised, Lord. We thank you that you've carried us through the night, that you never fall asleep on the watch, God. Come morning, God, there are new mercies, and you meet us with an I love you. And so we thank you, God. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would fill this place, cancel out any distraction, oh God. Be with us in this time, God. Open our hearts, our minds, our spirits, oh God, to what it is that you would have us to receive, God, and empty me of myself, oh God, and fill me with your presence. In your name we pray, amen. So we're going to get into a good amount of Bible today. Slow, slowly but surely, slowly but surely, we're going to get into the word. I'm wondering if it's ever dawned on you like it dawned on me that the psalmist's words in Psalm 23 had prophetic relevance and prophetic resonance for Jesus when he sat down with the disciples at the Last Supper. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. Thy rod to protect me, thy staff to guide me, they comfort and console me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed and refreshed my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house in the presence of the Lord forever. I was curious about the Hebrew word for my enemies, or if you're a New King James Version, thine enemies, because I wondered just what type of enemies the psalmist was talking about. Turns out the whole phrase, my enemies, in Hebrew means sacher. Can y'all say it with me? Sacher. Good, church. Y'all sound good. Which means to bind, to cause distress, to show hostility. You, God, pre prepare a table before me in the presence of those who have distressed me, who have bound me, those who have shown hostility towards me. You, God, prepare a table before me in the presence of those who have bound me, those who have distressed me, those who have shown hostility towards me. I'm wondering if it ever dawned on you like it dawned on me that Jesus was dining in the presence of his enemies at the Last Supper. Yet he said, I fear no evil. You, God, are with me. Thy rod protects me. Thy staff guides me. They comfort and they console me. That at this dinner, his friends perhaps had become his enemies. That maybe at this point in time, in Jesus's 33 years of life, that they were one and the same. If we are to connect the dots from Psalm 23 to Matthew 26, we realize that Jesus was indeed walking through the valley of the shadow of his own death, and that his father, God, had asked him to make a pit stop along the way. If I use my imagination, I, I can hear God saying, son, I want you to gather your friends one last time for this final meal. Now the thing is, or at least my thought is, more and more as I realize as I'm studying the Bible that Jesus' emotions, or to borrow from the term of some of my favorite black women writers during Black History Month, Sister Tony and Nikki and Maya, they might suggest that Jesus' interiority was often written out of the Bible, as in they dehumanized my Lord. I think Jesus may have been tired at this point. We don't know the time between Jesus' time arriving into Jerusalem on a donkey, but between Matthew chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 6, Jesus has already flipped some tables, cursed a fig tree, told about five parables, answered way too many questions from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and a whole lot of other stuff. I don't think Jesus was just okay at this point in time. 
We can gather that perhaps the only or one of the few times that Jesus had a moment to rest was in the home of Simon the leper. And when a woman, that's right, yet another nameless woman, anointed Jesus' body with oil, preparing him for burial. Jesus said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. And he said this to the disciples, his friends, who were mad that this woman had the audacity to tend to Jesus' weary body and mind and spirit in a time of need. They missed that not only their Lord, but their friend, their brother, needed some tending to. I wish I had time to park it right there, but I've got to keep going because Passover is coming. So join me now, if you will, in Matthew chapter 26, where it reads, When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table and the 12 disciples, with the 12 disciples, and as they were eating, he said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you that one of you will betray me. Being deeply grieved and extremely distressed, each one of them began to say, surely, Lord, not I. I'm your boy. It's me. And Jesus answered, well, he who has dipped his hand in the bowl with me as a pretense of friendship will betray me. Verse 24 says, the son of God is to go to the cross just as it is written of him. But woe, judgment is coming to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been good if that man had never been born. And Judas, the betrayer, said, surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, you've said it yourself. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, drinking, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood and the new covenant which is being poured out for as many, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You see, Jesus was tired, and he remembers, he might have this echoing in his ears. It was his father who asked him, his son, an obedient Palestinian Jew, Mary and Joseph's boy, to just host a dinner, just one last dinner. And it wasn't just any dinner. The title of my sermon is Divine Dinner. You prepare a table before me in the presence of those who will bind me, those who will distress me, those who will show hostility towards me. Now, how is this possible? I have a question. Why, why, would, Jesus, why would God ask Jesus to do this? How could Jesus, not in all of his divineness, but how could Jesus in all of his humanness possibly have enough love, enough joy, enough peace, enough goodness, enough kindness, enough gentleness, enough patience, enough faithfulness, enough self-control to say, okay, dad, I'll host this dinner. I'm dying soon, but if you say so. In a moment when Jesus knew that his 33 years of life were quickly coming to an end, he dug deep for some divine, holy hospitality to host this divine dinner that we know commonly as the Last Supper. Now, because I'm trying to be a good Baptist preacher, I've come prepared with a few exegetical event planning notes on how to host a divine dinner in the presence of your enemies. And so my, point, my first point is that point number one, you must be calm and mature. And if you're, you know, old school, you might say mature. Verse 20 says that Jesus was what? Reclining at the table. He wasn't pacing around. He wasn't in the back, you know, fixing his outfit. He was reclining. Jesus was calm, relaxed, trusting of God not stressed about what God had asked him to do, and not stressed about what his friends would do. Jesus was mature. If I knew in my fleshliness, in my humanness, if I knew that I I was sitting in the presence of somebody who was going to betray me, I might have a bit of an attitude. (laughs) First, I might not even invite them, to be honest. I'm going to be real with y'all. They would not even get an invite. 
And then Jesus, I, I could imagine if it was 2024 and maybe Jesus has, has a long, you know, those long table dinners set out, chairs, name cards, balloon arches from a black owned business, you know, wine from a black owned winery, you know. And he's like ready to step out, you know, ready to stun on him like, oh, I'm throwing his dinner. But Jesus was mature. And as the sisters of AKA, AKA would say this, because he was mature, because this is a serious matter that they're gathering. Maturity is required. Adversity requires maturity. And so he was obedient and, and understood the assignment and said, okay, God, I'm calm. I've been through a lot. I'm, go I'm gonna go through more, but I'm here. I'm calm, I'm mature, I'm spiritually mature. My second point is that you must be willing to host a divine dinner. You must be willing to be betrayed and denied. Sitting before him in this assembly of 12, of 12, not just any 12, but 12 who had been hand-selected, hand-picked, left their lives, left their jobs, walked alongside Jesus, witnessed the losses, you know, along the way, the ridicule, witnessed a lot with Jesus. And they were sitting before him, and here is Judas, the betrayer, and Peter, the denier. Verse 21 says, as they were eating, I assure you and most solemnly say that you, one of you, will betray me. They were apparently grieved and distressed and saying, no, God, it couldn't be me. And he says, listen, it's one of you before me. And, and Judas exposes himself, right? And God, Jesus is still saying, you know, it's better that you wouldn't have been born, but yet you're still here. Jesus, I want to remind us that in Jesus' humanness, we know that he was tired. He had been through a lot, but he called on God to help him be calm and mature in this moment. And that Jesus in his divineness could have excused himself from this dinner, could have dropped the bomb, dropped the mic and walked away and said, enjoy. It's on me, it's on the house. He could have saved himself and he was yet obedient unto his literal death. You must be willing in this life to be betrayed and denied by the people that you thought you could trust. And you must be willing to sit with them and look them in the face, knowing what has been said maybe to your face maybe knowing what has been said behind your back, and still invite them to take and eat. You can't just be willing to be betrayed and denied. You have to be what? Calm and mature. Let the church say, Calm and You can't just, okay, I'll be denied, but how are you gonna act? Imagine if, again, if Jesus was carrying on, if he was upset, if he had this, you know, anger about him. We know Jesus has righteous anger as he flipped the tables. But imagine if Jesus was not composed during this very trying divine dinner. Point number three is that you must be willing to forgive to host a divine dinner. Jesus said that, take, he said as he took the cup, he said, take and drink all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is being poured out for the forgiveness of sins for many. This blood, this divine dinner has a purpose. He's reminding them that you must continue to forgive. And I found it interesting that the one who was going to need forgiveness, or one of the people who was gonna need forgiveness, Peter, was sitting at the table. Because back a few chapters in Matthew 18, Jesus said, Peter had asked Jesus, Lord, well, how many times do I have to forgive? Is seven enough? And Jesus said, 70 times seven. If you could imagine not just Jesus on high, divine Jesus, but Jesus who, again, was with at the table with his brothers, that God in this moment was also asking him to forgive who would betray him asking him to forgive who would deny him. Not once, not twice, three times Peter would deny him. And yet God said, son, I need you to forgive him. You can't throw this dinner and be disingenuous. You can't throw this dinner with hate or spite 
or resentment in your heart. I need you to come into this dinner ready to forgive. 70 times seven. Now I know I said I was trying to be a good Baptist preacher with a three-part sermon, but my boss, the head of Holy Hospitality, paged me. I'm a 90s baby, okay? Holy Spirit paged me and said I couldn't possibly leave out the most critical components of hosting this divine dinner. You must have love. The scripture says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Scripture then says in 1 John, or excuse me, I'm backing it up, but if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I have nothing. Don't you see it? Can you hear it? That sounds a lot like Jesus in this time. See, I got too many papers up here. I'm going to find it, y'all. Here we go. Sounds a lot like Jesus. And you know, the scripture says that love is patient, kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Love keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and it never fails. If Jesus had not been able to equip himself with love for this dinner, I don't think this dinner would have turned out the same. He could have even delivered the message about the betrayer in different language, with a different demeanor. But in order for Jesus to host this dinner in the presence of his friends turned enemies, he had to embody an enemy embracing love that imitated the very character of God. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrated his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. The love, the love, the love was present, was even, I'd say, the main meal. God is love. Partake from this love that allows me, not in my own strength. We have to remind ourselves, Jesus was human. Jesus had surrendered a long time ago his ability to save himself. And he came into this dinner with his fleshliness. Yes, with wisdom of what was going to happen, but with the surrender in his heart. And so in 1 John 14, excuse me, 1 John 4, it says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and set his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. We ought to love those who distress us. We ought to love those who have been hostile towards us. We ought to love those who will continue to try us. We ought to love those who have denied us. We ought to love those who have betrayed us. We ought to love, and to love is to forgive. To love is to welcome somebody who has hurt you at your table. To welcome somebody who will not only hurt you once, but maybe three times. It is enduring love. It is a love that it speaks of in 1 Corinthians that never fails. It doesn't keep a record of wrong. It's patient because God, Jesus, God and Jesus knew, for that matter, that Peter was going to grow out of this triple denial. He knew that if he was approaching his, his, his friend with kindness, that his response, that he could turn back and say, maybe there's still some hope left in this friendship, even though I betrayed you. Jesus was not proud sitting at the table, patting himself on the back for the sacrifice of a lifetime. It was a sacrifice he really sought could be another way. But love protected him and those he was eating with. Love helped him to trust God in this plan and helped him to persevere through his crucifixion. Again, the word says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I fear no evil for you, God, are with me, thy rod to protect me, thy staff to guide me, the comfort and console me. Jesus needed to be consoled. You, God, prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies, and you have anointed through the woman and, and through God's hand, anointed and refreshed my head with oil so my cup overflows. Jesus was tired, but he came into this dinner overflowing with love. Surely goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house forever. Amen.